And then let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. And oh God, we just thank you that you desire to meet with your people. Even if there were two or three of us, you promised to meet with us. And so, Lord, we're here in your presence this morning. We're hungry to hear your word to our hearts. And I pray, speak, speak clearly to us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we've been looking at uh, we've been looking at Jesus and who he really is. And then the last uh, the last part of the series, we were looking at how Jesus, after he started his ministry, then he was starting to be going around to be preaching, he'd be teaching, he'd be healing, and then he went up a mountain, and his followers went up after him. And we saw how he spoke about their heart attitude through what we call the attitudes. And how God wants people who realise they're nothing without Him. And says, You are the people who are going to inherit. You are the people who are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And um, we also saw that the standards that we talked about being pure in heart, nobody could measure up to that. We all fall short. And nobody will see the kingdom of heaven until they're born again. And so we're continuing in Matthew chapter 5. And then uh, in a few verses, we'll read together. So if we look at Matthew chapter 5 and we're in verse 13. Matthew 5 from 13 down to 16. And he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a, hi on a hill cannot be hidden. Now do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl, instead they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And what Jesus is basically saying is here, okay you've come up here, you've seen me preach it, you've seen me heal him, you've come to here some more, and he says, but let me tell you this, I'm not interested just in spectators, everybody's involved. And that's what I believe Jesus is saying through these, uh, through these simple verses here, and they're very familiar and well known. I feel like first of all, the salt of the earth, it's a well known phrase, we use it, if we're talking about somebody's good and honest and trustworthy, they say, oh, so and so, Jimmy's great, he's the salt of the earth. But what did Jesus actually mean by it. And remember, a lot of time has passed. We kind of think salt, mm, well the chips would be pretty rubbish if you didn't have a bit of salt on it, but that's kind of about it. Some people um, maybe always have to have a bit of salt in their dinner, but salt in the times that Jesus was there was very was a very, very valuable commodity. We tend to think it's just sort of common and it's just sees through it out there. Um, but it was very valuable. So one of the things was in those days, you couldn't go to Tesco and buy yourself some sausages and some meat and then just expect two or three days later to eat them. Because you live in a hot country, there's no fridges, there's no freezers, um, and so, the, and also they ate a lot of fish. Some of the disciples were fishing here, obviously at Galilee, and that's who Jesus called. And so they used salt to preserve meat, and used salt to preserve the fish. And then that meant they could catch the fish, salt it, and then it kept for ages. And um, so it preserved things. And it's also used to season food. Because as we know, if you, if you just bought vinegar crisps, they'd be terrible. <laughs> it has to be salt and vinegar crisps. And chips and other food. So the food would be quite bland. If you just, if you just boil up vegetables, it didn't put any seasoning in them at all. Yes, it would keep you alive, but um, need a little bit of salt. Um, just to the add this to it. The other thing about salt is, it can be used to cleanse and to heal wounds. Um, and those days, remember, you couldn't just go down um, 
in this in the uh, the local chemist and buy your bottle of TCP or satellite or whatever. And so you have to rely on more natural things. And I know even this day, if we find that our horses are out in the field and they get a cut on their legs, the first thing we we'll want to do on them is take them down and get them in the sea. Because the salt heals up far faster than anything else. So we see that salt uh, was used to preserve things, it was used to add interest um, and flavour to things. We see that it's used um, to cleanse and to heal wounds. And in fact, we even read in the Bible that when new babies were born, they actually rubbed them with salt just to cleanse them. Um, and uh, Roman soldiers were playing with salt. Could you imagine working all day? Uh, Demon, could you imagine delivering all those pizzas and then somebody says, here's a packet of salt for you. <laughs> uh, but salt was, salt was valuable in, in those days. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't just, we're talking about natural things here, but we also see that salt actually had other significance. Leviticus 2, uh, but it's not the only place that tells us this. In Leviticus we read about all the different offerings that have to be made. But it said every offering had to be sprinkled with salt. It was unacceptable just to bring just to, to sacrifice a lamb, give sin offering, guilt offering, and all the other offerings um, that were listed there. So the salt was actually used in worship to God. So it was valuable there. And also we read about um, a very important thing as well. We read about a thing called the covenant of salt. The salt was used to confer a covenant, and the Bible tells about two uh, very significant places where this is used. One was uh, in Numbers. There was a God established a covenant with the priests, with the priests from the land of Aaron, and it was described as a covenant of salt. And then in the Book of Chronicles, it says God uh, made a covenant of salt with all the kings that were fallen after David. Um, so it was a significance for this. Salt is a big deal. So what did Jesus mean when he said, you are the salt of the earth? You know, maybe we feel insignificant in our life doesn't count for that. You know, we just about like, struggle and we get by and keep our heads down and we we'll hope for the best and that's it. That is not the life that Jesus calls us to. Um, and when we look at it there in Matthew 5, verse 13, at the end of that it says, um, But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything, except to be thrown out and trampled under food. So, um, we have to, the Bible says we're salt, but it says we have to be careful with what we're called to, because we need to be effective as salt. Um, and, um, so what does it mean for us when it means to be the salt of the earth? Okay, so if we go out to the door this morning and say, really, going to be salt? Um, now what? You know, what, does this, what does this actually mean to me um, to be the salt of the earth? So what is this salt that cleanses and stings and heals and preserves and that's favour that Jesus has called us to be. And I believe that's the word of God being revealed through our lives by what we say and what we do and how we interact with people. Um, we actually become the word of God. And first, for unsaved people, there some of them may occasionally read testimonies where people go and just be led, compelled to go to the Bible and read it. But most people will judge or be the first exposure to, uh, to the Word of God and to Jesus will be seeing our lives, seeing us, seeing the difference that Jesus has made within us. Is there something real within that person? What is that something real? And that then is the Word of God. And that's the thing that brings cleansing and healing and salvation uh, to those people. And so people need to see Jesus living through us. And it's not Say, come on to my church and you'll see Jesus living through my pastor. Or you want to go on to YouTube and you'll see this guy here and Jesus, Jesus is really living through him. That's not how it works. Jesus said, see all of you, every single one of you, you're the salt of the earth. You're the ones I'm calling to do this. 
to have an impact, to be effective, you realize you're valuable, they count for something, and don't be polluting yourselves and getting contaminated. I, I've called you to be pure in heart, as salt, to be pure, and um, that's what I've called you to. Um, and if you look, uh, <clears throat> if we look at Colossians, um, I'll just leave it here to see if you haven't turned up. Colossians 4, verse 6. It's an interesting verse. And it says, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. This is useful because, it's an interesting verse, because it actually tells how we use the salt that's within us. Um, it talks about using the salt, in other words, spreading the word of God, how we interact with people, how we reveal Jesus living within us to other people. Not by screaming and yelling scriptures at them, but doing it in love and using it effectively. Season, you, to season a meal, you don't dump two kilograms of salt and lay it on the top of it and say, job done. You use it wisely, you use it effectively, because we're not there to win arguments, we're not there to make ourselves look good, we're there to show that God's love has touched our lives and reveal that love of Jesus um, to others around us. And that's how we use, that's how we use the truth, uh, that's how we use um, salt. And the thing is, we have that truth within us, it's planted within us, and the Bible says that God gives the Holy Spirit within us as well to lead us and direct us, and so that's how we know how to use it wisely, um, and so that's how we use it effectively. Also, um, it's people are not just hearing the words that we're saying, but it's people need to see that truth in action within us. They need to see that something that it's not just stored on our lips, but it's actually coming from within. See that there's a change. See that there's something within us that's different, and that's what we've been given. Um, and so, we need to be serious about wanting our lives to line up. In the previous verses, Jesus had said, look, it's the pure in heart, it's the humble, it's the pure in spirit, those that know that there's nothing good in themselves that's worth bragging about. It's only Jesus within them. And so it's the same with us. We need to be serious about wanting our lives to line up with the truth we're sharing. And we can't do it by ourselves. We need to be honest before God and then say, look, God, I know I'm not. I know I'm not everything I need to be, but you can make me what I need to be and submit to him and let him do it. And you think, maybe, maybe it's easier, um, I hear what you're saying, but maybe it's easier just to sit back and there's always going to be people better equipped than me to do this. And that's not really my thing. Um, but Jesus didn't say, I'm going to pick just the elite, I'm going to make, pick my disciples and just this inner circle, they're going to be the salt of the earth. He said, it's everybody. We don't have a say in this. It's what we're called to. And even though God knows exactly what we're like inside, and as, you know, uh, when we read about Paul in Romans, and he says, oh, I just feel, I just feel weak. If he was the brother, I would say, I feel weak. Worthless man that I am. You know, I know the good stuff I'm supposed to do, and I don't do it. And I know the stuff that's wrong, and I end up getting pulled back into it. But then he says, but praise be to God, who always causes me to triumph. And so if we're honest before God, and when we know the times of our lives don't quite line up with what he's called us to, let's be honest and ask, and let's ask his help um, in it. Um, okay. But the other thing then that really springs to mind is, but sure, sure, in the Bible it says that God was going to send out pastors and teachers and prophets and evangelists to do the work. They're the work that qualified. God's not picked them. God will equip them, they're the ones that are going to do it. But if you actually read about it in Ephesians 4, it says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. And was that to go and reach the lost? No. Verse 12 says, To equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. So yes, God gave us these gifted, talented people, anointed people, but it was to teach us and lead us and encourage us, so that even with what we think is nothing, God can take our nothings and use it um, so effectively. Um, but, 
And, and as we were just, when I was thinking about this, and remembering kids' church, and when Moses said, like, could you imagine what it's like to actually appear before the burning bush? For God to say, take your shoes off your feet, this is holy ground. I'm going to send you to be a deliverer of the message. You're going to be the one. And Moses says, can you not send somebody else? He's calling us. He's calling us. So let's look at verse 15. He talks about life. Neither the people lay the lap and put it on their bowl. Instead, they put it on stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We aren't called to sit quietly in a corner and hope that nobody notices. We're not. We're called to come together as a church. We're called to go out and reach the world. We're not called to sit at home and watch the God channel and just think, well, sure, it's just me and the Lord. And as long as I read the Bible and I get some teaching from somewhere, and it's just me and the Lord and that's, that's it. That's not what we're called to. Um, we're called to be part of this church. But not, sorry, the whole world isn't called to be part of Lighthouse Church. I think it would be bigger than us. But the church isn't about, the church isn't about names over doors. The church is the body of believing believers who come together under the lordship and authority um, of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're called to publicly, through our lives, display what Jesus has done for us. And even if we think we're only a, a 10 watt bulb and we're kind of just a bit flickering there, it's the fact that all of us come together and people say, the impact that Jesus makes on millions of people. And yet, people in Glocky aren't going to see millions of believers. People in Glocky are going to see the people that are saved in Glocky. People in Malay are going to see the people that are saved in Malay. So we're called to show the light of Jesus, show the light of Jesus uh, to those that are around us. Um, and yet, that light we were told to be to publicly display when Jesus has done amazing things in our lives. Let people see it. Let people know about it. But yet it says uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, just the tail end of uh, verse 5, so you need to look it up. But it says the light exposes things, and people don't really want to. People don't want light to be exposed. They want to put on an ear, they want to put on a show, and don't want people to see behind it. Um, and so we read, he will bring into the light of day all that is present, all that is present is hidden in darkness, and he will expose the secret motives of man's heart. There's lots of people don't want their inner secret motives to be revealed, to the very respectable movement, but just being good living, having a respectable veneer, just doesn't cut it. And so not everybody wants that light. And so there will be opposition to it. And look at the opposition Jesus had and the disciples had. They weren't sort of sitting there quietly getting an the easy life. They showed, they carried the message that they were called to carry, but they paid a price for it. Um, and also, remember too that as we go around, it's not our role to force people to be saved. If the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to people, the Holy Spirit doesn't convict them, prove them the reality of Jesus, we're not going to do it by screaming and shouting at them. Um, and also, we need to be aware uh, that sometimes we don't have to have all the answers. You know, sometimes you think, I couldn't talk to people about Jesus because what if they ask me about this? What if they ask me about that? And there's a lovely story in John 9, um, verse 25, it's about the blind man. And he's been healed and he's seen. And the leaders, the religious leaders, pull together and say, they say, oh, that must be wrong. They basically want to question on the doctrine of, you know, could you convince, convince us that what just happened to you is real? What, what authority did this man use, this man Jesus used? And it says, he answered and said, whether it be a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, and now I see. And so that's, if that's all we've got to say, I was lost in sin, and I met Jesus, and he set me free. I don't need to be able to explain all the different doctrines and theories and interpret the book of Revelation to people, um, um, you know, to the nth degree. And the world doesn't, isn't really interested. 
Truth isn't interested in whether we're pre-millennial or post-millennial or amillennial or whether we're pre-tribulation, raptured, before, in the middle, or after the tribulation. And yet these are the things that Christians sometimes get divided on, or whether get the opinions for today or not. And churches split over such things, and there's arguments, and there's division, and Satan loves division. But we have so much more that unites us. And the main thing is that, that we are called to show what Jesus has done in our lives. It's our experience. How you see it me is completely different from how you see it Jonas, or how you see it Linda, and uh, how you see it Devon. We've all, we're all unique. We've all been brought to Jesus by our own unique paths. And so that is what we are called to show. And just, um, you know, there are different people out there. There's people who could have met lots of Christians, been in lots of church services, and yet they could just possibly meet you. And there's something you'll say, and I'll say, oh, wow, I never thought of that before. And I'll just head home because God can use it. Um, so, what does all this mean? The thing is, Jesus wants, Jesus wants to reach the world with his message of hope and salvation. He hasn't set a time when he comes back every 40 or 50 years in person to walk the earth again and to preach again and to do miracles again just in case people forget. He came to the earth once, he left, he left his Holy Spirit and he said, these people that follow me, you're called to be salt, you're valuable, you're called to be light, you're visible. And that is how, um, that is how the word is going to spread to this nation. It's not that God has come, that Jesus came up with this way just to save himself a dollar or because it's going to be ineffective. With what we do, and we just do with our own efforts and do nothing, but with what we do and with the enabling of the Holy Spirit, God will use us. And I believe that's what he's calling us to this morning. And even if we think we don't measure up, maybe we do tend to just live in our own little bubble, in our own little huddle. Um, maybe you're the person that God's speaking to right this morning. And so, as I said before, we need to be honest before God on that side. Look, I don't really, I have a real difficulty with that. But I surrender to you. Help me be the salt, help me be the light, help me be a witness. For you to those around you. Help me be effective. Help me use your word wisely. Let other people see you live it through me. And maybe as you hear this, maybe you think, well actually, I can't really do that because I don't have kind of drifted along, but I've never actually got to the stage where I'm totally committed to Jesus in the first place. And he doesn't call us just to fake it and hope so that nobody sees in behind the facade that we've built up over all these years. So he calls us at any time, just humbly, put our pride aside, humbly come to him and say, Jesus, come into my life. I repent of the sin. I need to start again. I need you to come. And I need you to come and fill me and enable me. So let's, um, let's just pray together and ask God just to help us be more light, more salt, in this earth. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for your challenging word. For it's simple and it's direct. You haven't called other people, other churches. You haven't called more gifted people. Somehow, we are the people that you've called. Ordinary people. And so, Lord, I pray that you would enable us to be an effective witness for you in this world. Lord, that you would cause us uh, to share your word and your love through our lives as salt. Lord, that we would be visible, that people would see you living through us. Um, and oh God, I just pray that you would enable us to live our very best lives for you. Lord, we just thank you for